Hello, everyone, and welcome to Promoting Community Inclusion, How to Prevent Institutionalization in Emergency Management. Uh, this is a great panel, and I did want to note that while my colleague Elizabeth Woods was referenced as a moderator, this group has decided to go it alone and just present themselves, which is great. Um, I'm quite happy to introduce our panelists, Shailen Slazoulis, German Parodi, and Priya Pinar. How, how did I do? So, so you can, you, you're going to have a chance to introduce yourselves now. And if you'd be kind enough to do so by um, providing a general description of yourself, as I will now. I'm an older uh, white male wearing a blue shirt with small dots. I'm sitting in my office in Brooklyn, and uh, I, have a, uh, I have white hair and a white beard. With that, I will turn it over to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, and good to be with you all. My name is Shailen Sluzalis, alongside German Parodi. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a younger woman with light skin, long, curly brown hair, and I'm wearing a navy blue shirt. I use he, her. I'm a brown skinned um, Puerto Rican man uh, with long hair tucked to the back, I'm wearing a red polo shirt today. Uh, we are both currently located on the Lenape land, also known as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, we are the co-executive directors of the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies, also known as the Partnership. Uh, we are the U.S. disability-led disaster hub by and for people with disabilities throughout disasters and emergencies, a national disability-led nonprofit organization. And I'll let Priya introduce herself. Hello, everybody. My name is Priya Penner. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive assistant at the partnership, and I am a young, brown, disabled woman with long, curly black hair. Today, I'm wearing a uh, floral blouse uh, with a dark blue-gray cardigan, and I am on the Haudenosaunee lands, also known as upstate New York. So happy to be here with you all. With that, we'll get started sharing some slides with you all that I know folks are also sharing uh, the access to them in the chat for folks uh, and the Dropbox links to download for yourselves if folks need to, or certainly afterwards. Uh, do want to note that we will be mentioning some resources that are throughout the presentation, so hope that is a, a valuable resource for folks moving forward. Um, and today we are presenting, as Mark mentioned, on promoting community inclusion, how to prevent institutionalization and emergency management. On the screen is that text that I just read and the partnership's logo, which includes a sun with four images within it and the words, the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies to the right of the sun. And the four images within that sun are a hurricane, a thunderstorm cloud, a house with a split down the middle and a tornado. Um, and at the bottom of the slide is the partnership's website, which is www.disasterstrategies.org. As we get started, we want to introduce who we are at the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies is the only US disability led organization with a focused mission of equity for people with disabilities and people with access and functional needs throughout all planning programs, services, and procedures before, during, and after disasters and emergencies. Before, during, and after disasters, the partnership works to bring together disability, le disability leaders, emergency managers, public health officials, and community stakeholders. Before, during, and after disasters, the partnership leads whole community inclusion, emergency preparedness, disaster response, disaster recovery, and disaster mitigation. And we work to equip communities with skills based in equity, tools, resources, and relationships before, during, and after disasters. And by doing all of these things, the partnership expands disaster readiness and community resilience throughout the nation uh, and globally as well. And really, uh, we at the partnership are a a disability led hub that is uh, focused solely on the rights, needs, and inclusion of people with disabilities and people with access and functional needs before, during, and after disasters and emergencies. 
we'll get started by just sharing some of the state of disasters, but really grounding us in some uh, facts and uh, and how we certainly do our work here at the partnership, but as they impact people with disabilities that are institutionalized throughout disasters and emergencies. As many of us know, disasters are increasing in intensity and frequency. Uh, and I'm sure that is no surprise to all of us as we experience extreme heat, extreme cold weather, uh, tornadoes in areas that maybe they were not before, like in Los Angeles, California earlier this year, uh, and certainly within areas uh, that they are more well known and uh, continuing across our country. And as we are all preparing for the upcoming hurricane season, uh, which in no doubt will be a continued intensity and frequency in size and magnitude and in events. Um, but some statistics or some uh, highlights to just share and really uh, have an understanding of disasters increasing uh, from CNN, a quote that reads, snow inundated Buffalo faces more challenges in the aftermath of storm that left 31 dead in the area. Uh, from the states with the highest rate of natural disasters is a quote that wildfires in the Western United States are not only becoming more frequent, but larger in size and deaths. And from the National Weather Service that extreme heat kills more people per year than any other weather event. And with that is a disproportionate impact that people with disabilities and people with access and functional needs face throughout disasters and emergencies. Uh, if you haven't heard yet throughout the course of the week that people with disabilities are two to four times more likely to die or be injured in a disaster than non-disabled people. This comes from the United Nations, but it is also uh, based on data and feedback from uh, Hurricane Katrina and other global events. And also, uh, during Hurricane Katrina, Black people were 1.7 to four times more likely to die than white people. And this quote comes from a uh, article called Disparity and Disaster Preparedness Between Racial and Ethnic Groups. Uh, so we know that people with disabilities and people with multiply marginalized identities are the most impacted, face the disproportionate impact throughout disasters. And we'll get into uh, one of those impacts being institutionalization in disasters. This slide reads disaster related institutionalization and a quote from a, a National Council on Disability um, report called Preserving Our Freedom, Ending Institutionalization of People with Disabilities During and After Disasters. This is a resource for folks. It is a, uh, a really well done report and some of our uh, colleagues and uh, co-workers at the partnership were part of uh, drafting and creating this report. And some quotes that come from it is the threat of disaster related institutionalization has been an ongoing concern in the disability community for well over a decade. And institutionalization is often an outcome of unequal access to disaster services. And when we talk about the disproportionate impact of people with disabilities and the disaster related institutionalization of people with disabilities, largely this disproportionate impact and the impact that we face and that leads to institutionalization is the lack of access to resources, to equitable uh, information in formats that is accessible to people with disabilities, and access to resources and services that support people with disabilities to live independently in our own homes and communities. Absolutely. Um there are a number of reasons why disabled people are institutionalized during uh, disasters. We're going to talk about um, a handful of them here, um, in addition to what uh, Shaylin had shared uh, just a moment prior. Next slide, please. The first uh, reason that uh, disabled folks are institutionalized during disasters. The first one we're going to get into um, is the concept of medical model of disability. Uh, and we know that the medical model, uh, you know, has this view that people with disabilities are sick, that we need to be cured, that we're broken. Um, and if we can't be cured, if we can't be fixed, uh, then we are better served um, by medical professionals or in separate medical settings. Uh, next slide, please. 
the way this plays out in during disasters and how the medical model leads to institutionalization during disasters is is in, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, first, you know, people with disabilities are separated from family members, and we are shuffled um, off to special need shelters. This increases the likelihood that we go to institutions. Separating from family members allow uh, folks to convince us that we are better off served in nursing facilities um, as our quote unquote special needs are better uh, met in this medical setting. Additionally, disabled people are uh, sent to hospitals instead of shelters because non-disabled people believe that disability automatically equals complex medical needs. Uh, just because we're disabled does not mean we need the advanced care um, available in hospitals. It does not mean that we, um, even if we do have complex medical needs, does not mean that we will automatically need hospital care. It just means that our needs in that moment are uh, the same as everyone else's, but the way we get those needs, the way our needs are met might be slightly different. And that, that way of uh, we can then access those needs um, is different, but does not mean that needs to be in a hospital. And then finally, um, disabled people are forced into nursing facilities to open up beds in hospitals. We talk about this, uh, you know, pipeline, if you will, of, uh, you know, special needs shelters into institutions or even special needs shelters into hospitals and then institutions. Um, ultimately, this belief that people with disabilities need to be served by um, medical professionals. Um, is incorrect and leads to um, people with disabilities being shuffled off um, from hospitals where they don't need this care, where they don't need advanced care in any way to nursing facilities so that beds in those hospitals are open to folks who need them. Next slide, please. Additionally to um, medical model uh, leading to institutionalization, uh, Shailen mentioned lack of appropriate planning. Uh, disabled people are forced into institutions because local governments and non-governmental organizations do not adequately plan for and with people with disabilities throughout all stages of disasters. I wanna highlight the for and with people with disabilities. It is so vital that people with disabilities are part of these planning processes, that we are not uh, left out of the conversation so that non-disabled people can assume what we need and try to meet these assumptions that may or may not be accurate. Disabled people are experts in our own experiences and our own lives, and we know how we need what we need to survive a disaster. Include us in these processes. Next slide, please. The way that lack of appropriate planning leads to institutionalization is again multi uh, multi dimensional. Um, shelters. For example, are often not physically accessible, which force disabled people into physically accessible institutions. If disabled people were involved in the discussion around sheltering, around um, which shelters are accessible and how to get that information out around accessible shelters, uh, we would not be forced into institutions that meet our physical accessibility needs, but uh, force us into uh, and to institutionalization. Additionally, local governments and non-governmental organizations do not have plans to ensure personal attendance services are provided in shelters. Uh, a lot of our needs as disabled people do rely on um, you know, support and help from uh, personal attendance and these services that allow us to stay independent in the community. Just because we need personal attendant services does not mean we need hospital care. If local governments and non-governmental organizations plan with people with disabilities, we can ensure that MOUs with PAS agencies are provided for folks who are in shelters. And then finally, 
There are no processes in place to ensure people with disabilities are not forced into, in, into an institution during or after a disaster. There is no communication between local governments and non-governmental organizations to talk about how we can ensure that people with disabilities are in the community in their own homes um, when it is safe to do so. We need to talk about uh, and plan with disabled people uh, to ensure that these plans and processes are in place. Again, work with us, include us in the conversations to ensure that the plans that are being discussed are effective. Next slide, please. And then the third reason we're going to touch upon today for why uh, disabled people are institutionalized during disasters, one of the main reasons is a lack of understanding of civil rights laws. Non-governmental organizations and, I apologize, non-governmental organizations and local governments need to have an understanding that federally funded disaster related programs and services must be accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. It's vital to understand that civil rights of people with disabilities are never suspended, including during disasters. By recognizing that disabled people have access to these disaster related programs and services, or, and that uh, these programs and services have an obligation, um, the entities have an obligation to ensure that these programs are um, accessible to people with disabilities, um, then um, that would ensure, help ensure that people with disabilities are not forced into institutions. Next slide, please. Just to reiterate um, and, and highlight how this lack of understanding leads to institutionalization, uh, lack of understanding of these obligations, you know, leads to folks believing that institutionalization during disasters is somehow okay and or lawful, which of course would increase institutionalization. Uh, non-governmental um, staff from non-governmental organizations or staff uh, from local governments seem to have this belief that, uh, you know, because it's a disaster and that it's an emergency, uh, it's okay that the, you know, that people are temporarily, quote unquote, temporarily placed in institutions. We, um, as a disability community, know that temporary placement in institutions really means long-term placement, really means um, forced institutionalization and fighting to, get out, struggling to get out of the institution for years. Uh, institutionalization is never okay. And these processes need to, from the beginning, plan for and with people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Any questions or comments? This is Shaylin, and seems that we should have also introduced Bean, your cat, who has made a, an appearance here and there uh, for anyone that hasn't seen him run by, uh, which we all enjoy, I think. Uh, I do see in the chat that Sylvia mentioned, I will never use a, quote, special needs shelter, general population, or a hospital for extreme medical conditions is what we plan for. Uh, and I see your colleague Mildred saying hello uh, from Mappy. And I just want to highlight, uh, I know if folks were with us earlier, as we heard from uh, Dr. Joe Stramondo sharing about vulnerabilities uh, and the impacts that we have as people with disabilities, a lot of what Joe spoke about was the vulnerabilities that uh, are in society and, and around us in environmental settings that, uh, quote, make us vulnerable. But would like to kind of push back on that just a little bit and say that you know, as disabled people, and I know Joe would agree, uh, we are not intrinsically vulnerable. Uh, it's certainly, as he mentioned, due to the lack of access and accessibility and inclusion in our society, in our programs, in our services, in our systems. 
Um, and that is no different when it comes to disasters and just places a bigger uh, disproportionate impact on our communities uh, where sometimes that is the only solution that people can see is an institutional setting. Uh, which is very unfortunate uh, as we see and something that we continue to to push back on and why we at the partnership uh, which are led by people with disabilities for people with disabilities continue to highlight that we are not vulnerable we are resilient we are decision makers we are uh, first responders in our communities and we are able to to really play a vital role in disaster planning response mitigation and recovery uh, so just also wanted to highlight those pieces, certainly as we just followed uh, Dr. Joe Stromando and, and his important words and uh, research as well. Just checking to see if we have any questions in the Q&A box. Do you see any, Priya? This is Priya. I do not. I just want to uh, highlight Alyssa's uh, comment in chat, which is if you have any questions for us, please do feel free to submit them in the Q&A at any point. We do have several spots where we will be pausing to take questions as well as pausing at the end for additional questions. So please feel free to pop your questions in the Q&A at any time. We certainly want to hear from you, so please don't hesitate. We would love for a dialogue discussion. So let us know what you think. Put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we definitely want to have a discussion as well. So with that, uh, as we get into uh, the bulk of our conversation is uh, preventing institutionalization and emergency management um, and some of those promising practices that we see within our community. And I know we've kind of touched upon some of them, but just to really lay it out there, uh, some promising practices that we know well, especially within the disability community, is creating inclusive disaster and emergency planning, response and recovery policies that include the rights and needs of people with disabilities and ensuring that these policies have input from disabled people, uh, disabled led organizations, community stakeholders, advocates, people within your communities, um, making sure that we are at the table and a part of every piece of these policies that impact our lives. Um, and one way to go about that is by creating emergency management stakeholder work groups and ensuring that disability led organizations and people with disabilities are included. Uh, Disability-led organizations are one way to identify and, and, and reach out to people with disabilities within your communities, but we all know uh, various ways of reaching out to people with disabilities and, and people with access and functional needs throughout disasters and in our communities. And remembering to invite disability-led organizations that prioritize multiply marginalized disabled people, as well as uh, inviting people with disabilities that have multiply marginalized identities. And also just just to go back for one second uh, on that piece is not only um, inviting or creating these work groups or stakeholder engagement sessions, uh, whether you're an emergency management agency or if you are a disability led organization or disability related organization. Um, and these spaces, if they do not exist within your communities, uh, within your local community, within the state or within your region, uh, certainly creating those spaces yourself and inviting other stakeholders that are key and vital within that response and within planning and recovery areas uh, to be involved, including emergency management, public health officials, uh, first responders, Red Cross, uh, other stakeholders that play a vital role within response and recovery, uh, like transportation companies, healthcare uh, facilities and professionals, and ensuring that everyone has a, a seat at the table, that we're all talking to each other, identifying those systemic barriers and identifying the solutions and, and ways moving forward to support each other and to, uh, make sure that that disproportionate impact is not as heavy on the disability community, making sure no one is left behind and ensuring that people with disabilities do not get uh, institutionalized unnecessarily. Some other promising practices, and I sort of touched upon them as well, is building those relationships with your local or state and territory emergency management and public health officials, 
uh, when hosting conversations around disasters and emergencies, invite them to present, to attend, to share, and to work on the, the barriers that we continue to see that may be new um, or may not be identified yet and how we can um, come together to address them and make burdens less on, on people that are most impacted by disasters and emergencies. And also building relationships with local service providers that help people with disabilities maintain health and independence in the community, uh, like transportation companies, paratransit agencies, uh, other organizations that provide uh, services like personal assistance services that Priya touched upon, and asking them and working with them on what their plans look like in disasters and emergencies. What, what is included that is ensuring that we are prioritizing people with disabilities living in the community and also people with disabilities that are, are in institutions already and ensuring that those plans are adequate and, and supporting people to live independently and maintain their health and independence throughout disasters and emergencies. Before we go on, what, what happens, go back to just this, maybe this fact, but what happens when we do not implement such promising practices? Uh, in 2022, uh, during Hurricane Ida, we saw more than 800 people being from a nurse, from multiple nursing homes up to seven, being put into one warehouse where there should have been more than 150 people uh, for numerous nights, found illegal, people are being persecuted. Uh, the owner of the nursing home was the owner of the warehouse, but this is what happens when people with disabilities are not part of the planning. Uh, similarly, uh, from another angle, in New York City, uh, the, in, the, the newer mayor has deemed that nursing homes are the place to put people who are homeless, people who have psychiatric disabilities. During the pandemic, we, the CDC early on came out saying, Nursing homes, congregate settings are places where disease spreads. And now with the public health emergency ending and long COVID and COVID being real and ongoing without now the necessity for masking, we must do everything we can to prevent placement into congregate care settings. And this is Shailen also, I, I know Joe spoke about uh, sort of how COVID became so widespread in our United States uh, through the first really citing an outbreak being in a nursing facility and just emphasizing that that uh, continues to disproportionately impact our communities. And as we all well know, COVID is not over, not done, and, and continues to disproportionately impact people with disabilities uh, throughout the US and, and globally. Some other uh, promising practices and this one uh, and the following slide that comes is uh, two pieces of legislation that are, uh, one is introduced and one will be introduced in um, as, as soon as the debt ceiling conversations are uh, hopefully at an end within Congress. Uh, first being the Ready for Disasters Act, which Ready, R-E-A-A-D-I, stands for Real Emergency Access for Aging and Disability Inclusion, Ready for Disasters Act. In the House, that bill number is H.R. 2371, and in the Senate is S. 1049. Uh, some highlights that the Ready for Disasters Act would uh, put in place uh, for the disability community. And certainly there are other pieces within this legislation uh, that is good and promising practices for people with disabilities in emergency management and disaster response. Um, but some key highlights that we wanted to share with you all is that the Ready for Disasters Act would ensure a strong disability and older adult voice throughout all phases of disasters would create training and technical assistance centers and research centers across the 10 regions, and would require the Department of Justice to examine how the civil rights of people with disabilities and older adults are or are not upheld during and following disasters. And a newer section that is in this uh, Ready for Disasters Act in this new reintroduction this year um, is the crisis standards of care section, which would identify uh, Hospitals, healthcare systems cannot discriminate against people with disabilities 
uh, throughout emergencies, public health emergencies and disasters. Which is something I think we all well know and, and continue to advocate and fight for, um, but certainly we saw that impact at the onset and throughout COVID-19's pandemic of crisis standards of care um, really disproportionately impacting people with disabilities with lack of access to uh, ongoing services and supports and medical services um, due to uh, the, the ongoing need throughout COVID um, and other folks being prioritized. Uh, going back to really where we started, as Priya mentioned, uh, the medical model uh, of our society. This is Priya, and I just wanted to jump in and go back a little bit to uh, crisis standards of care. I think it's so important to really name um, not only the ableism that's found um, in these uh, standards, but then also the racism and the homophobia and, and the discussions around which lives are prioritized. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, crisis standards of care, discrimination towards people with disabilities, uh, we need to mention uh, Michael Hickson, who is a Black man uh, who was hospitalized uh, due to COVID and um, Michael, uh, Michael's wife, Melissa, was actually told by the doctor that, um, that essentially uh, Michael's life was not important because he was a disabled person, that he had no quality of life as a disabled man, as a Black disabled man. Um, and I know that when, uh, you know, when we as the partnership talk about this and when we're in conversations with Melissa, we uh, make sure to really highlight that Michael was uh, a father, right? He had uh, beautiful children that loved him and um, wanted him to get better. Uh, we share a picture of uh, Michael in a hospital bed um, with his children surrounding him when we talk about uh, these uh, crisis standards of care because it's so important to highlight and remember the uh, joy that disabled people have and that our lives are worth living um, as disabled people. And this is someone just to wrap that piece up. Michael was not only uh, denied healthcare in a healthcare setting, but the cause of that was dehydration and malnutrition. They stopped feeding and giving him liquids because his quality of life was not good enough for feeding or drinking. Uh, in El Paso, Consequently, uh, there was a hospital uh, calling an area the pit where they would put those who they deemed would not survive and not attend to. Uh, these are the very dangerous parts of crisis centers of care that Ready aims to mitigate. And turning to another piece of legislation, uh, as I mentioned, this one is not yet reintroduced this session, but has been introduced in past uh, Congress sessions called the Disaster Relief Medicaid Act, also known as DRMA, uh, which would provide interrupted access to Medicaid services when recipients must evacuate across state lines which increases health maintenance and community living and prevents in institutionalization during disasters. Essentially uh, providing Medicaid follows the person in disasters and emergencies, presidentially declared disasters uh, where this would be allowed and would provide uh, resources for that host state when you cross a state line into a new state for services and, and certainly safety and evacuation uh, in that host state this uh, this bill would also provide federal resources, 100% federal match to provide those resources to folks that are evacuating needing Medicaid services. Um, it would also provide technical assistance and support to develop innovative statewide strategies to respond to an influx of out of state individuals. So also adding to additional, not only funding resources, but assistance, uh, technical assistance and support to provide those um, supports and services throughout the state to people who evacuate from another state. And uh, would also create a grant to help states develop an emergency response core uh, to provide home and community-based services 
uh, one of the bigger gaps that we see and certainly one of the leading uh, ways to an institution is lack of access to home and community based services, personal assistance services, other services in our home and in our community. Um, and this bill would also create uh, in, an additional support for home and community based services in disasters and emergencies. This is Pri. Before we jump into questions, I just want to highlight, um, given that Ready has been introduced, um, again, that's S1049 uh, in HR 2371. We do uh, have resources and advocacy tools if you're interested in getting the word out, encouraging, encouraging um, you know, your networks to get the word out around Ready. Uh, you can go to reaadi.com. Um, and on uh, the Ready website, you'll see um, tools such as a congressional outreach template, social media templates, an action alert template, and a press release template, as well as uh, more info about Ready, as well as Derma. Um, we'll have, of course, uh, tools when Derma is uh, introduced. Very important points. Thank you, Priya take a moment to pause and see if there's any questions or reflections in the chat or the Q&A. I'll let you let us know if there's anything there. My boxes have disappeared. This is pre I don't see anything quite yet, but we're happy to pause for a moment to give folks time. And I see Alyssa is reminding us that the uh, chat feature is also available throughout the webinar. So uh, feel free to share any thoughts or reactions uh, in the chat as well as um, sharing questions in the q and I think the main takeaway that we'd like to share with you all is really, and, and I know this has been mentioned throughout the week um, and is really important throughout is to include, incorporate, prioritize, ensure that people with disabilities, people with access and functional needs are at all of your planning, your response, your recovery tables. Um, and not only just that we are there at the table, but that we have and play a vital role at those tables. Um, and ensuring that if those tables don't exist, or if you don't know that they exist, creating them and making sure that the whole community is involved and um, having an active role within all areas of your disaster and emergency response areas. Let's see, we're getting a question uh, here from us uh, about an update on the status of the Ready for Disasters Act. Uh, it was reintroduced recently, uh, just this past March. Um, and we are, as Priya said, continuing to you know, galvanize the community and ensure that uh, we are all aware of its importance and certainly throughout Congress. Uh, one exciting uh, mechanism that we are seeing hopefully um, and continuing to push within our advocacy efforts is seeing Ready for Disasters Act added as a title within the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act reauthorization, uh, which has to happen every five years. And we're looking at hopefully um, highlighting and continuing to advocate for Ready for Disasters Act to be added within that reauthorization as a potential mechanism for its passage, hopefully this year. Um, and we continue to really highlight the, the needs throughout the community certainly within our rights and our civil rights throughout disasters, but also in support to organizations, to advocates, to people with disabilities in disasters and emergencies through some of the avenues that are created, like the technical assistance centers, like the research centers, uh, which would be focused solely on disability and disasters throughout all 10 regions, as well as a national advisory uh, council that would be made up primarily of people with disabilities, people with access and functional needs to um, have a vital role and voice throughout all aspects of disasters and emergencies. Anything I missed on, on ready? Um, Papa, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, uh, the, 
bill language is being led by the help committee in the Senate. Um, so uh, majority chair Sanders is a co-sponsor of Ready now. Um, so anything that you can do to reach out to the help committee in the Senate, remind them, include Ready as a title in the PAPA as it's being drafted right now. It's uh, the action that we need. This is Priya. I see that we have um, a comment in the Q&A. Um, uh, as you were describing the horrible choices made by medical personnel and the perception of a patient's quality of life, I couldn't help but think that lives are precious, but society has taken upon itself to judge. Culture of death, quote unquote. I also see a question um, from Mark in the chat uh, to uh, Shaylin and Herman. How did you guys build the partnership? Uh, where did you guys start for grassroots advocates? And how does the partnership interact with government agencies during disasters? Thanks for the question, Mark. I'll start by saying uh, the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategy started in 2016 following Hurricane Harvey and uh, was actually first led by Marcy Roth, who I know was part of uh, the panel discussions earlier this week. Uh, and when she uh, left FEMA as its uh, Director of Office of Disability Integration and Coordination, worked to build a community uh, through the partnership where we bring folks together regularly, uh, disability advocates, organizations, government agencies, uh, to really address the systemic barriers and identify strategies for moving forward, support to disability-led organizations responding in their local communities, and certainly uh, support directly to people with disabilities impacted by disasters as one of our uh, first and main um, areas of support was through our disability and disaster hotline, which is still ongoing, available 24 seven, all days of the year for people with disabilities, advocates, family members, organizations and agencies uh, needing support, assistance, resources and information throughout disasters and emergencies. Herman and I got involved at the partnership in 2017 following Hurricane Maria, uh, where we were deployed to Puerto Rico for three weeks, uh, responding to needs throughout the disability community and particularly in rural areas uh, of the island and the interior of the island, um, making sure that folks had access to supports and services, durable medical equipment, supplies, and certainly uh, food and water, uh, humanitarian assistance, but also bringing together key stakeholders like Centers for Independent Living, like the Protection and Advocacy Agencies, like the Developmental Disability Councils, with emergency management officials, with FEMA, with those agencies that are responding and, and have a responsibility to our rights and needs throughout disasters and ensuring that those relationships were being built and continue. And certainly, uh, I know I saw Mildred, who's on the line from Mavi, uh, is a vital part of that as well. Um, and really ensuring that people from all sectors cross disability are involved uh, in all of these aspects in our local communities and on a national level. Uh, one other way we do this is by continuing to bring folks together on a weekly basis. Uh, we have a weekly national stakeholder call every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and all are welcome on those calls. Uh, it's an opportunity to share across our agencies, across sectors, and across disability of resources, information, and support uh, when disasters strike. And since the onset of the pandemic and whenever disasters occur, we reach out to local communities, local disability leaders uh, to support and see how we can support in a disaster and emergency. And at the onset of COVID, uh, we've continued to do that by bringing folks together and really um, looking at what are the systemic barriers we knew we were going to face throughout the pandemic and how we might be able to um, address them and call attention to uh, the systemic barriers for government agencies and other uh, responsible agencies to address. Um, and we started that call with a uh, focus on a call to action, which then began a, a daily COVID-19 disability rights call, uh, which has now evolved and continues each and every day at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And all are welcome to that as well as we continue to 
discuss, uh, support, and identify uh, ongoing strategies for, for moving forward in, in our society throughout disasters and emergencies. Um, just as a last um, plug for our weekly stakeholder calls, um, this coming Tuesday, the new director of FEMA's Office of Disability Integration and Coordination, Sherman Gillums Jr., is joining us to give a presentation on his new director's intent. He's been at the position for going eight, nine months, uh, very uh, collaborative, engaging. His first appointment was to Puerto Rico. We made sure that he connected with the Centers for Independent Living. We continue meeting weekly and it, we'll put a link on the chat. Please join us next Tuesday. Love the questions, please keep them coming. We just have a few more slides, which really are some resources for you all uh, and hopefully will be of use to you moving forward. And we'll just highlight them here uh, for all of us. One is one that I mentioned already, which is the uh, National Council on Disabilities Preserving Our Freedom, Ending Institutionalization of People with Disabilities During and After Disasters, uh, which is a really one of the biggest and probably only uh, at this point uh, federal areas where we have this systemic barrier and this this problem identified and that we need to continue uh, working towards uh, mitigating that and, and ensuring that we are uh, putting people with disabilities in the community first and ensuring that the that that priority is there for our community. Uh, another resource for folks is uh, the Partnerships 2017 to 2018 After Action Report, which really highlights uh, some of the barriers that we saw in Puerto Rico, as well as in Hurricane Harvey and other disasters during those two years. Um, and that report is called Getting It Wrong, an indictment with a blueprint for getting it right. Uh, and there's many resources and highlights throughout that report as well. Um, and one resource that we love to share, as, especially for folks that may be newer to these conversations around people with disabilities and disasters, is uh, a documentary by Rooted in Rights uh, called The Right to be Rescued, and really highlights the disproportionate impact in those real life stories of people with disabilities being left behind in disasters. And then some additional resources uh, as we all continue the work uh, moving forward from this week is a resource for folks in the community and folks impacted by disasters and emergencies on how to file a civil rights complaint. Uh, and certainly we at the partnership, as we help folks file civil rights complaints, and also as we receive calls throughout our disability and disaster hotline, always uh, use our local protection and advocacy agencies as a resource for callers and for folks that are working on civil rights complaints um, and as a vital role that protection and advocacy agencies play in disasters and emergencies. And also a resource on, uh, as we mentioned throughout today, is to you know reach out to those local uh, organizations, agencies, responsible and government agencies. Uh, if you do not know who your FEMA Regional Disability Integration Specialist is, uh, each region has one and are uh, specifically focused on disability integration throughout disasters in your region. And we have a list of those uh, region folks in our website and with their contact information as well. And if anyone finds any difficulty navigating that or contacting your local or your regional disability integration specialist, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'd be happy to help facilitate that connection. And also, uh, as we have talked on uh, at the beginning, some of the statistics and facts of people with disabilities in disasters, um, there is some new census data that shows and I really identifies how the US has failed disabled people after disasters. Um, and we have a, a small write up that, that highlights some of those key findings from that census data. Um, and certainly we know all those folks that are out there that love to, to dig into data, there's lots out there that we could extrapolate from um, and certainly continue to highlight the disproportionate impact throughout disasters and emergencies. And as I mentioned, uh, our disability and disaster hotline is always available. Folks can call or text that number at 800-626-4959 
or we can also be contacted at hotline at disasterstrategies.org for the hotline. Lastly, we want to thank you all for hanging out with us today and, and, and having us for this last part of the conference today. Uh, certainly such an important conversation that we should all be having within all of our regions and so thankful for folks at Disability Rights New York who have uh, done all the hard work to facilitate and coordinate today and this week's conference. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our information is on the slides uh, and uh, we always encourage folks if you have you know, resources that you're needing to support finding or any connections that need to be helped uh, facilitating that we are here to support each other uh, at any time. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Well, See if there's any other questions that we have. I, I on behalf of DRNY, um, I'd like to ask Priya, um, because we haven't had a chance to get granularly into that, how did you get involved with the partnership with this advocacy work in the context of your professional development? Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I have been a lifelong disability advocate and activist. I, uh, you know, started in my teens and, you know, of course, as a disabled person, we all have to be our own advocates, self-advocates. And so I guess I should say I started earlier, uh, but, you know, officially got involved in my local disability community and advocacy um, in my teens. And that really just led to this, um, you know, uh, understanding of this need that, uh, you know, disabled people need to um, fight for our rights. Um, that led me to connect with Herman and Shaylin. Um, and, you know, um, in our advocacy work, um, you know, I was able to learn so much in terms of how to best advocate uh, for people with disabilities in a number of ways uh, from Herman and, uh, and Shaylin. And so, um, you know, in uh, July of 2020, an opportunity arose with the partnership and it was just this amazing opportunity to be able to blend my passion for disability rights and advocacy uh, with this larger conversation that people aren't having with people with disabilities and that's um, emergency management and response. Um, and so I joined, um, as I mentioned, in uh, July of 2020 and, um, you know, really with this um, focus on multiply marginalized communities and uh, looking at how uh, disasters and emergencies impact multiply marginalized disabled people and um, what are our solutions, you know, uh, the disability community is known for, uh, you know, finding the solutions ourselves because we know that uh, no one else is going to have them. Uh, and so uh, what are the solutions that we're, we're, we have and we're coming up with? And how can we as disabled people, as a disability-led organization, take those solutions, highlight and promote them, and also enhance them, right, um, to ensure that people with disabilities are not forgotten during disasters and emergencies? Oh, I'm so glad I asked th that question. Um, you know, I'll share with everybody on this call that as we interview interns and people that wanna do pro bono work with us at DRNY, when I first started working here six years ago, um, people would say, well, I wanna be a civil rights attorney and I think this is good work. Just this year, people are saying to us, I wanna be a disability civil rights attorney. Um, that's why I'm coming to DRNY. And I think that that evidences a shift in the commitment and the fact that the civil rights work is so compelling for all of us in the you know, disability community. So um, some of your comments, uh, Priya, sort of reminded me of that. Um, I thank you all and all of the speakers that were with us this week. I'll, I'll use this opportunity to kind of wrap things up for the week. Um, I do wanna take a moment to thank all of the DRN staff that made this conference a reality. As you all know, there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of planning. We've been doing it together. DRNY's hope is that these discussions and also DRNY's file up compilation of a speaker's, uh, of the speaker's expert analysis and what is going to be a public report form as we've discussed with each of the speakers, 
We hope that this is going to act as what amounts to a call to arms to policymakers at the federal, state, and local level um, that first and foremost, people with disabilities need to be at every table that matters um, and playing leadership roles and that um, inclusivity and accessibility is something that has got to become uh, standardized. And, and, and as, as Pri, I think you or you mentioned, just follow the law, follow the ADA, follow the REF Act. Come on, let's do this together. But DRMI can do this, DRMI can do reports. It's the continued advocacy of everybody that's in this room, that's been in each of the Zoom rooms throughout the week that is going to, you know, collaboratively propel this movement, if you will, forward. Um, so we look forward to seeing what the networking that we hope um, will be generated by all of the people that have come to come to our info, you know, our, our um, uh, our information base today and all of the listeners, I'm hoping, you know, somebody's talking about Marcy, somebody's talking about June, one of our moderators, all of their great work, and you see how it all comes together. And we just need to be kind of emphasizing that. So I'll leave it by saying, as we always do, if you have any questions about this topic, anything you haven't gotten to today, please email us at emergencypreparedness at drny.org. And I'll remind you each other that the recording of this event will be made available um, uh, on our YouTube channel within two to four weeks, as long as as soon as we add all of the appropriate accessibility components. So thank you so much again. Thank you to all for joining us. And let's have a safe week and keep speaking. Be well.